Welcome to the Learning Circle, the ultimate video podcast for educators and parents who want to unleash the full potential of children. Join us as we explore the fascinating world of learning with the help of thought leaders who will share their knowledge and stories with us. This is your host Kavleen Kaur and I'm excited to take you on this journey. Get ready to be inspired, informed and entertained. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Learning Circle. Today we have the privilege of delving into a fascinating topic that lies at the heart of effective education, the learning design. We'll be exploring how thoughtful and intentional design can transform the way we approach teaching and learning, ultimately enhancing educational outcomes for learners of all ages. Joining us to provide expert insights on this topic is Professor Anil Maman, a renowned educator and expert in learning design. He is a professor of practice at the Center of Excellence in Teacher Education, TISS, Mumbai. With over two decades of expertise in learning design and curriculum development, he has held significant roles at Tata Interactive Systems and Tata Class Edge. He conceptualized the multiple learning experiences model. He has authored articles on education in mainstream media and has been a featured speaker at at prestigious events and institutes. Today, throughout our conversation, we'll be diving deep into the principles, strategies, and best practices of learning design, all guided by Professor Maman's wealth of knowledge and expertise. Together, we'll explore the why behind the learning design, the key component of effective design, practical methodologies for implementation, and insights into the future of this dynamic field. So if you are an educator seeking to revitalize your teaching practices, a learner eager to understand how design impacts your educational journey, or a parent looking to support your child's learning, you are in for a thought-provoking discussion. So without further ado, let's jump right in and explore the fascinating world of the learning design. Thank you for coming on board, sir, in on our channel, The Learning Circle. So I'll start the discussion uh, with a question on uh, what is learning design and what is its significance in the world of education? And also, when we talk about design, I understand that for a tangible object like a building or a piece of art, it is very easy to understand what designing an object means, a tangible object. But when we talk about learning experiences, please help me understand what does design mean in terms of such experiences. Look, I mean, this is a question that I get asked a lot uh, in terms of because people understand what it is to design a tangible object and something abstract like learning, what do you mean by designing that? Right? So let me try and explain the best way I, ca- I could I can. Um, very simply put, planning learning is about uh, finding the most effective way to teach and learn. Um, although it's called learning design, there are some aspects of it that deal with designing tangible objects, like teaching learning methods, for example. It could be a textbook, it could be a worksheet, uh, a question paper, or even a whole assessment uh, itself. It could also involve um, technology, like creating an educational virtual game or an educational simulation, uh, design simulation or a virtual lab thing and, and so on. It could even be a whole online course, uh, for instance. Uh, imagine uh, teaching small children single digit additions. Uh, you may start with a story that involves finding the total number of mangoes in a basket. Uh, then you may use mango cutouts to model problems like 3 plus 2, and get students involved in a hands-on activity. You could even convert this hands-on activity into a game. In the next class, you would remind them of what they learned and then introduce the concept of number lines. That way you could move from concrete to abstract, which is probably what works better for children of that age. So thinking about this whole experience and designing a plan and strategies for it is what learning design is all about. Right. And you talked about taking it from the 
uh, concrete to the abstract, especially for long, uh, younger sister uh, students, that really makes sense. So we, you have given us a very nice definition with some examples of what learning design is. And so I would now, uh, you know, uh, go back to the second part of my question. What is its significance in the world of education? So um, education involves planning, right? So, and sometimes, you know, many of the things that teachers do instinctively or even intuitively are actually, you know, even if they don't look at it as design, that's an aspect of design to them, right? So, for example, how do I plan for my class? Every teacher plans all for them. Right, the components, the strategies that go into planning a particular class is also an example of them. Right, so it's a different thing that whether the plan really works in a class. So there is one which is like deliberate. So you create a deliberate plan, structuring. You know what? What are the for, for one? You will identify what is the learning objective that I want to achieve. For well, let's say, for example, I take chapter one in mathematics. Um, and maybe I'm going to do, deal with only topic one of that chapter in tomorrow's class. Now, what are the key areas that I want to teach tomorrow, right? And then now, if, if addition is the thing that I'm going to teach tomorrow, what are the ways that I could teach addition to the, given the fact, given the, given, given my children's current level of understanding, right? So I, I make a plan for it. Now I go there and start teaching based on the plan. I, I kind of figure that some things are working and some things not, don't seem to be working. So right over there, I make customization. I, I make, you know, I'm, I, I, I improvise on what I really planned uh, because the way I'm carrying out what I thought would work better is not really working out better in the class. So that's another kind of design. You're thinking on the feet and doing it right over there. Okay? So teaching in itself has these, these aspects of learning design, which teachers, you know, um, uh, not very consciously, they make use of design in a way. Right. So you talked about how it is done. The teacher creates a plan and then takes the plan into the classroom and then runs the plan in the classroom. It may work. Some things will work, uh, which she or he can continue and some things which are not working can be uh, redesigned. Right. And uh, two, uh, two questions. So why, uh, you know, what, one is that when the teacher is creating a plan, is it based on previous experience, intuition, uh, and the current set of students the teacher has, or it should be based on some uh, empirical results, some research. How how does learning design address that? Does it consider, is it purely based on experience of the educator or based on uh, scientific research? Yeah, so this is also one of the reasons why we seen, uh, although we all think that everybody can become a teacher, but it's not, it's a specialized job, right? So we have, that's why we have special, specialized qualification for teachers like BA and so on, right? And uh, in these courses that they, they, that they take, they are exposed to some, you know, something called the pedagogy and pedagogy and learning design are very much interrelated. Okay. So um, pedagogy probably has a broader definition of how you carry out your teaching within a classroom, but learning design, you know, contents itself with the, with the things that happen before the live interaction happens, like the things that you need to th think about, the things that you need to plan for, okay? and that's what learning design, you know, contains. Um, so that, so as I said, learning design is informed by pedagogy, and pedagogy is something that all teachers are exposed to, various kinds of pedagogy. Right? Uh, now the thing is this: like for example, when we talk about evidence, um, there are there are some theories, for example, that are more sometimes more ideological in nature, because that is my conviction that if I do this, uh, this is what the students need to do, for example. Okay, there are certain theories that come at it, come at it from a slightly ideological point of view, and there are some theories which are, you know, which take a slightly more scientific approach. Like for instance, how does the brain work? How, how does the brain process information? And these are, um, you know, um, and, and based on how our brain process information, how memory works, etc. Then they may look at uh, teaching strategies in that angle and see which of these strategies are uh, enabling better processing for example. Okay. Uh, there are, so as I said, there are contenting theories and contenting models, and that's the beauty of this field. So it is not uh, art science like physics or chemistry, where right? you can say for certain that this is exactly what you need to do. So even when we talk about evidence space, it's, it's essentially uh, these evidences are coming from trials and errors. Okay. So that means that, of course, 
you should ideally try and adopt some of these practices that are proven in many instances and stay away from practices that are not proven to work. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you stop experimenting, stop reflecting on your practice and improvising on it. So you, you will continue to do this trial under the exercise even when you're, you know, being a teacher. Like take the example of a doctor, you know, for instance. So they also have, you know, let, let's say for instance, somebody who uh, graduated um, in medicine in the year 1980 or 85 may still be practicing as a doctor. Now, of course, you, you cannot practice what you kind of learned in 85, right? So medical science also, also you know, goes through lots of advancements. So you have to be consistently in touch with your field, not just from a practice point of view, but also from the theory and from the new advances in the field. So every a teacher also needs to be in touch, uh, constantly keep learning about the new models, new um, you know theories, new evidences that are emerging in that field. And that's what is being a professional. Or that's what being a professional. Is. Right. So you uh, talked about a very interesting concept that uh, learning design is influenced by how we retain information, how we receive, process and then retain that information. So uh, would request you to throw further light on, you know, how exactly or uh, given what sort of information humans retain better and what information or what processes are known not to be very effective you know all this would help a teacher design more eff effective and efficient uh, lesson plans yeah so I'll I'll, I'll 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 make an attempt uh, you know i need to put the caveat out here because these are all emerging tools because there is uh, i said you know, I'd like to keep reminding that this is not a hard science so things that could be contested later on um, and that's how exactly how any science would move forward is that you know you there are some aspects of what what is what a particular scientist or what a particular theoretic has put forward some aspects of it could be falsified later but as things stand there is something uh, just fairly dominant in this field called the cognitive load theory okay um, and it's based on what we refer to as the cognitive architecture like how does our cognition work what's the architecture for our cognition the way in which our cognition works uh, and here, learning in this in this particular instance has been given a certain narrow view okay, in terms of what is it that you're able to retain and what is it that you're able to retrieve. Um, okay. So from that narrow definition, definition of learning, let's look at how memory works. Okay, so this is the this is the kind of model that is put forward in this theory called the cognitive load theory. And many times it's been experimented on and evidence currently favors the model. So there's something called sensory memory uh, in this model. Sensory model, uh, memory is something that um, that works uh, for a very, very short time. And when we're sitting in the classroom or when you're sitting anywhere. Uh, so let me give the example of uh, remembering OTP. So you get an OTP on your phone. You remember it for like a few seconds, right? You could probably quit with, with sensory memory. So that's very, very short term. Right. That is the working memory. So working memory is where, you know, when I'm, uh, let's say, for example, when I'm taking a class or when I'm attending a class, there is some aspect of it I'm, I'm paying attention to, some things I'm not paying attention to. So the things that I'm paying attention to stays in my working memory. And you will need to kind of work on your working memory. So there are, like, if a teacher is able to use strategy in such a way that I'm able to activate my working memory in such a way that I think about the problem, so think about the content uh, information that is interested in the class, a little more deeply than otherwise. Let's say, for example, if I'm doing, if I listen to some bit of a lecture, then I'm, um, uh, then the teacher asks me certain questions around what she just presented. Uh, then I go on to do uh, maybe an hands-on activity, and then it's, it's something that I, I really uh, feel engaged with. What it is that I'm doing? Maybe the task is a very authentic task, something very related to, to life, for example, right? So based on the strategies and based on the effectiveness of the strategy that I use as a teacher in the class, the students may feel more cognitively engaged. And, and if, you, if you feel more cognitively engaged, that means that you're thinking about the problem that you learn, or you're thinking about the content or the concept that you learn. Okay? And, that, and from that, so when that happens, over time through the working memory, it moves to your long-term memory. Okay? Provided you keep revisiting what you learned today. Lecture to 
So it is not, so learning is not never a one-time event, right? So it's not like, uh, so I learned something today, I, 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 you know, I even know how to solve my problems today, but I, um, you know, I'm, I'm likely to forget it a few days later. Okay? So we bring this thing called the spacing over there. So there is something called the spaced uh, repetition or spaced practice. So what I practice today, if I don't practice like let's say a week later, I'm likely to forget it. Simple example, if you, you know, we all probably studied a lot for our board exams in 10, uh, but today, uh, and at that time we felt a certain mastery about the subject that uh, you know, we were preparing for. Um, today, if all of us would sit for the board exam, you know, uh, I don't know how many of us are likely to, to, to do well uh, in any of the subjects. It's a problem in subjects that we specialize in or we teach for. So uh, that itself shows that, you know, there is, you know, learning is a lot about, just the way learning is about retention retrieval, learning is also about a lot of forgetting, right? Uh, and forgetting is fine. It is not it's essential to remember everything that you've learned. Uh, but the key aspect, the key ideas are something that you have to, uh, for one, as a teacher, you need to identify what are the key ideas that I want my students to take in. Okay? There's a term for it, it's called enduring learning, so enduring understanding, okay? So, and that's what will, you know, stick with you for a lifetime. The other aspects of content are things that you learn. Uh, they are like, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're part of the strategy that takes us to the destination. So content knowledge is critical, but not all content knowledge may be equally critical to you uh, later in life. But there are certain big ideas in the content that are applicable for you even later. For instance, the whole point of learning science sometimes could be a, to look at look at events, look look at uh, our, our the material life, for example, um, from a scientific point of view, right? And what do you mean by science? What is it to to kind of evaluate what counts as true? What how do we know what counts as true, or what is the evidence for that matter? These are all part of science. So, how do we get students to to engage with scientific thinking, for example, when we are taking a particular class. It is not by teaching scientific thinking explicitly. You could do that, but even when I'm teaching a particular lesson in science, I, I, I know I go into it with a certain depth. You know, students are likely to understand what, you know, how, how did these scientists arrive at this phenomenon? For you? you understand the process through which you arrive at certain, certain facts. Right. So we covered a lot of ground uh, in this uh, previous uh, discussion here. And uh, uh, just to reiterate so that I also understand properly and for the benefit of our audience. So from working memory to long term memory, uh, the information goes only if the teacher is using certain strategies, uh, good strategies. We'll, we'll come to what does this good means here. So uh, you, by using certain strategies, teachers can help their students get the information from the working to the long term memory. And one aspect which you mentioned is spaced repetition, wherein the same uh, uh, content is uh, repeated at a gap of, you know, few days, few weeks or whatever is appropriate. And uh, that helps the students to retain information. And also, you know, when during spaced uh, repetitions, the students keep on retrieving the information also there by reinforcing learning so that is one key uh, you know aspect of the learning design so thanks for sharing that with us um, if I uh, you know if as a practitioner uh, an educator wants to implement few strategies uh, you mentioned one like space repetition so can you uh, please give us a list of strategies or the key uh, practices that a teacher can do to help the students first of all understand the concept uh, get them in the long-term memory retain it and also retrieve it as and when required so the strategies or some practical steps you know uh, the teachers can use yeah so, uh, so i'm sure teachers probably with the practical knowledge can talk about much better than i can but uh, broadly there are some things um, that i'm sure all teachers use but just to reinforce, so one, if we discuss um, some of the things that learning science recommends, uh, you know, for that matter, most important thing is what they what the refer to as retrieval practice. Now, retrieval practice is like you learn something in, in the class and you learn it through different methodologies. You learn it sometimes, you may use, teachers may use explicit instruction, 
uh, like you know directly teaching in after students questions. Sometimes they may use hands-on activities or or project. Uh, but when you even when you do hands-on activity or a project, there's a sudden distillation of knowledge. Uh, students are able to you know uh, articulate. Students should be able to articulate what they learn from doing a certain activity. So it's not enough just to do an activity and move on, but getting the students to talk about what they learn from the activity. Right. So that's one thing. And then you again do retrieval practice is things like you know asking simple things like a quiz. Button. Asking students questions, how, what, why kind of questions uh, in a class is retrieving back. Being able to retrieve what I learned. Uh, okay. And and that, seems, and that is much better, even for learning, not just in, from a teaching learning point of view in the classroom, but even for self-learning, retrieval practice is a great uh, way to learn. So, for example, I, I read, um, I'm reading a text, for instance. I stop at the first page, and then I try to write a short summary of what I learned in, in, in the first page. Okay. Um, I'm trying to recollect what I, I learned from that one page of information, right? So that's retrieval practice, and that helps cement information better than trying to read that same page multiple times. So retrieval practice works better than repeated reading, for example. That's one side. Second one we just mentioned about spacing. Now, when you talk, when you talk about space repetition, space practice, it doesn't mean that you're repeating the same thing over and over again. You repeat the same concept in multiple contexts. So your question, when if you're using space practice, the nature of your question will vary. The nature of the problem may vary. Uh, the example or the scenario around which you are you know, conceptualizing the, uh, the, the, the concept will vary. So because you need to be able to, so that is a concept called uh, flexible knowledge. Okay? Now flexible knowledge, let's say for example, if you are a, if you are a teacher, uh, your flexible knowledge is your understanding of pedagogy. When I say flexible, you learn a certain kind of pedagogy. Now I'm able to interpret it creatively based on different differing types of learners and different types of learning contexts uh, in which I'm teaching. Right? So that's so that knowledge in a in a in a teacher with experience is become flexible. It means you can that I can adapt it to different environments, different kinds of learners, and I can creatively interpret it. Okay? There's something called inflexible knowledge. Inflexible knowledge is a concept by Daniel Willingham, a, a cognitive psychologist. So inflexible knowledge is essentially not root knowledge. It's not root, it's not root learning. So root learning is essentially when you learn something um, and try to you know, memorize it without understanding the meaning of it. Okay? So you you know the words, but you don't know what they mean. You're just parroting it in a way. Right, right. Flexible knowledge is where you also understand the meaning, but maybe you're not at, at that stage where you know you can creatively interpret it or you can adapt it to a different environment. You need more exposure on that aspect. Okay? So you move from in, inflexible knowledge to flexible knowledge. So inflexible knowledge is that stage where I, I'm not able to, to adapt it to different circumstances or different situations. And then I become an expert, I can become flexible. So it is fine even if I learn something without really knowing how to apply it for some time. I do have an understanding. Uh, I have a certain understanding, but I don't know how to do it. Right. So that was really wonderful. And, uh, you know, uh, I really appreciate the concept that all these practices we were talking in terms of the educators imparting teaching to their uh, students. But like you mentioned, even a student uh, who is uh, uh, learning new concepts, he can also apply the same strategies to uh, have more effective learning. Uh, he can do a spaced uh, uh, retention uh, spaced uh, revision of the letters of the content in different contexts and then you know try to retrieve it using different methods to uh, better understand the concept so that is uh, really good that uh, the same principles if i understand it correctly the same principles of learning design can be used by an educator to teach the students and a student uh, himself or herself to better understand and uh, you know get these concepts into their uh, long-term memory so the strategies are the same the interventions the methodologies are the same strategies could at an overall level be somewhat similar but there's a difference like for instance learning is an individual self-learning is an individual aspect you don't go to school for individual learning i mean there is an aspect of that individual learning that happens but in a the school the affordance of the school allows you to interact with each other in a group so how do i you know get 
that collaborative aspect, um, interacting with peers, interacting with uh, you know teachers, for example, I need to bring that into the picture because that opportunity you don't get it when you're uh, studying by yourself. So um, you know teachers will make use of this aspect of uh, social we could call it social learning or the fact that you know how do I uh, how do I thrive in a group and uh, you know also op what are the different opportunities that is that a learner has when when while while sitting with it so for for one being able to um, present an idea to the whole class um, that in in improves once increases one's confidence ability to articulate one's my understanding better over time um, you know face an audience those skills are also embedded in, in the school scenario which is difficult when you're learning by yourself at home. Right. So, uh, uh, certain uh, practices of repetition and retrieval done in a group would enhance learning in, in a school yeah, environment. The way, you, the way you would do it in a classroom is very different in, from the way you would do it by yourself. Right. Right. Yes. There are more opportunities uh, for such kind of learning in a group, in a classroom. Right, yeah. like you like you mentioned, and when we are talking about a classroom setting, there are learners with the diverse uh, level of understanding, uh, diverse level of intelligence. So, how does learning design address these uh, differences in the learners' uh, capability? Yeah, you you, are, you you put that question very well in terms of capability and understanding. Because sometimes the question that people ask is, how do I teach a learning a different learning style? And, uh, you know, um, I just want to say that there is no solid evidence to say that teaching, teaching to address different learning styles work. Um, there is very little evidence for that as things stand. But still, sometimes facing certain institutions, um, people tend to believe that you know learning styles is a fact, but it is it lacks evidence. So. Uh, let me start on that a little bit and then uh, I'll come to the understanding. For example, um, if a child, if, you know, for, first of all, how do I, how do we determine that a, a certain ch child is visually oriented or a certain child is verbally oriented and so on? You know, there are mostly, it's a subjective assessment, right, to begin with. And now, uh, and that needn't necessarily be true because it, as I said, you know, like the, our brain works in a certain way, right? So we talked about how the brain processes information. So there's a, pro a theory called the dual coding theory. And it's again been something that's been verified multiple times. The dual coding theory says that you tend to um, to understand verbal and visual content together. Okay. And it, 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 and it works better. It's, it's better to encode visual and verbal information together. Okay. Um, and that's so common, sometimes it may sound common sensical. Like for example, when we ask a child to um, imagine uh, an apple, for example, uh, he or she would be thinking of the object, like there may be an image of the object apple, in, and also the concept of apple, the abstract concept of what it, what's an apple, right? So it's embedded within me. It's not just an object. So there's a verbal or a or a or a logical or an abstract concept and the visual concept together. So that's how uh, we typically process information, right? Probably also one of the reasons why we, you know, we have difficulty in understanding abstract because of the, our difficulty in visualizing abstract concepts. It's easier to learn concrete things first because, you know, you encode it visually and verbally together. So that's one. Second is, uh, you put it nicely in terms of understanding. So understanding is a key thing that we have to figure. So a lot of our instruction to some extent, to, to great extent, has, has to be catered based on the levels of understanding of children. Uh, that essentially is their prior knowledge. It is not the prior knowledge that we want them to have. You know, we may want them to have a certain kind of prior knowledge, but that may not be there when we're teaching children at this point, right? So for example, you need to know addition before you come to multiplication, right? Um, and all, all the children may not be at the same level of mastery of addition when they come to multiplication class. If that's the case, the children who not really uh, uh, adapt that um, addition may need to become better at it before they come up and start moving to multiplication. Something simple like that. 
but in, in something like mathematics it's easier than you know easier to easier to imagine something like this. but it's difficult when you look at something like a social science but uh, and and then the other one is about you know lived experience or lived knowledge versus uh, textual or academic knowledge uh, some people may have a certain lived knowledge understanding the others may have a textual understanding um, the lived, lived knowledge sometimes is you know it's difficult to convert it into textual knowledge sometimes but you know if they have to move into a formal learning environment they may also need to to learn to articulate it in in the in the in, in the way in which we expect them to articulate right so we can bring them there it's not like a compulsion that immediately you have to you know discard the you know you, you shouldn't be discarding the experience knowledge you should actually build on it and that's great knowledge and that knowledge is you know in a way deeper than just textual knowledge isn't it because for example a child who grows um, uh, you know in in, 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 in in areas where there is access to trees and access to natural environment uh, you know the child's knowledge of trees and plants may be actually much better and deeper than somebody who comes from an urban area uh, who don't have that kind of exposure but the urban child may have exposure to books and that probably he can he or she can name different plants and, uh, and, and, and trees but doesn't have the lived experience right um, so you know both are different scenarios isn't it? so as a teacher i need to look at both the cases and figure out what what is best for, for both these children how do i cater my teaching to ensure that both the children are involved in the learning process so essentially all learning starts with prior knowledge and you build on it Right. So very interesting concepts there, sir. So first I'll start with the, you know, uh, you mentioned about the teacher should uh, uh, first assess the real knowledge of the students, not just assume that they have that knowledge. So uh, am I right to assume that uh, the starting point of a learning design would then be assessment of the current knowledge of the students and all plan would be based on the current knowledge that they have going forward and not just, you know, assume that let's say grade four students would be at this level of you know of course some assumption has to be there that they may have basic literacy and numeracy knowledge but then it is important to build in a first step of assessing the real knowledge that's correct but when we say assess the real knowledge we should not confuse it with an assessment like a formal assessment okay, hmm. okay. right confuse it with something like a pre-test or uh, or a, you know or an exam or something like that uh, and that's where a lot of uh, teacher intuition comes into picture. So you, you start a class, you ask a few questions around, you get to know your, your students better. I mean, every teacher, every good teacher gets to know his or her students better. And, and that's a sign of a good teacher. Uh, and there are various ways you can do it. You start a class, you tell a story, you see each other children that are, who are responding, uh, and you listen to the response. You ensure that every child gets to speak. Uh, and uh, you know, maybe it, it takes a little time. It's not like an immediate thing. Not, not, maybe not on the first day that you'll come to know uh, the different learning, learning level, levels of every child. It takes time and effort for us to know uh, where each child stands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it comes to, uh, it doesn't, it does, I mean, there's no formula there, but you know, there is, uh, there is tact and there is, there are ways in which you, uh, you do this so-called assessment, but never a test. Right, right. So we'll talk about assessment uh, in a bit because that's also, uh, you know, one elephant in the room always when we talk about education. But then coming back to the second point you mentioned about different learning cap uh, capabilities was uh, uh, lived uh, versus uh, textual knowledge. So that is also very interesting. And the example that you gave about somebody being in a natural environment, being able to relate to plants is something which, you know, recently uh, it really occurred, if I can share that with me. I just started to share that with you. Uh, I uh, have lived in Delhi all my life and not really exposed to nature as such. Recently started uh, gardening and my attempt had been to actually learn the names of all the plants. And I was doing that fairly well. But then, you know, one day my household help uh, said that, uh, you know, you need to uh, uh, water that plant less. And I was asking her, what is the name? She said, I don't know. But, you know, she gave me a list of five, uh, um, you know, signs why the plant needs more water. So even though she may not have that textual knowledge of what the plant's name is, but she has that lived in 
uh, experience about you know being around that plant so uh, yes you know that is very important but then you know the question is how do we uh, so lived experiences are very different in a classroom setting so uh, is is there a way what are your suggestions that how do a teacher address these differences in the lived in experience of these students i understand that difference also adds to the richness of the collective uh, uh, knowledge of the classroom so there could there be some uh, lessons where you know there's this exchange of different lived in experiences happen so uh, you know as i say i think every good teacher is adept at getting students to talk about the experience okay in the context in the is that relevant to the class that i'm talking about um so if i'm taking a particular class in over as i said over time i'll ensure that almost every student gets to speak and i would what you would be doing is by asking certain kind of questions you're also trying to elicit responses and you kind of know where they're coming from so as a teacher you know that a certain response is coming from lived experience a certain kind of response is coming purely from textual knowledge or sometimes the combination of two right so that is a judgment that a teacher makes and that's something that no learning designer can uh, plan for uh, right. because that happens right there and that's also one of the reasons why sometimes this so called the um, self paced online courses for instance they don't they will never have the kind of power um, that a, that a really good teacher can do in it because this, these are these are what they call customization and personalization the real customization real personalization uh, what the machine does is a very different kind of a personalization um, right i mean there is a certain personalization that machines do uh, but it's it's quite different from the way in which uh, i talked about an example of a teacher who elicits responses from students i'm not saying that all teachers do it but that's what teachers do right right so that's another interesting point and we briefly uh, touched technology there so i think we'll move on to that technology aspect so technology enables a certain uh, kinds of personalization it enables access to people who may not necessarily have access to that kind of uh, learning uh, but it also has some limitations which you mentioned so let us uh, understand more about you know what is the impact of technology on learning design is technology helping learning design or is it creating a few challenges also uh, i i i'm sure it must be a mixed bag so please help us understand that in fact learning design gained its prominence thanks to technology because there was you know technology intervention in teaching and learning and you needed a certain you know a certain specialization to to design learning which it stand on its own or something that um, you know a, a certain kind of technology that teachers can use um, to enhance the teaching <clears throat> in in the, in the classroom um so that's where you know a lot of the learning design work has been going on for for quite some time uh so that um, that's one thing second is in terms of of emerging technologies and how they impact learning design right so if you look at something like chat gpt or any of those new you know generative ai to speak uh with its advent a lot of the work that earlier uh what learning designers were doing even some of the work in chat gpt can do in terms of you know given a certain kind of input it can, it can churn out a storyboard uh given a certain kind of input it can churn out even a, a design document a pedagogically um oriented design document all these things are things that a chat gpt can do or or any other uh generative ai tool like a bing or any of those other ones but what it can't do is the is the process is the is the learning design process okay now learning design process involves I mean, there are different kinds of processes one of course i mean we could make use of the, a very popular learning design process called adi where uh, adi stands for a d d i e okay which is a stands for analysis d for design d for second d for development i for implementation and e for evaluation that's a very popular model uh, of uh, of a process it's not a model i mean although it's called an id model it's actually a uh, it's actually a process so you do an analysis of your learners and your uh, you know it could be learners sometimes it could be even be teachers depending on what is it that you're you're creating so let's say for instance if you're if you're creating um, 
a series of lesson plans at a, at a centralized level for a, for a stage, for example, uh, you're designing that feature. Then you need to know uh, the context in which, in which these teachers will carry out these lesson plans. What is the kind nature of students? What is the level of understanding? What's the level of understanding of your teachers? For this? And so on, right? So there's a lot of contextual understanding that you need to have to do your analysis well. Okay? So you'll ask questions, you do observation and so on. And then you do your design. Based on the understanding of your of your users, of learners, or teachers, or whoever, based on that you will create your design strategy. Okay, so that's 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 that bit about it. So that's something that you know that analysis is not something that a, you know a GPT can do because that involves observing te uh, real teachers, real students, talking to them, gaining insights, making the right inferences, and you're not just going with a preference. You're going to be you're, you're still going to be guided by pedagogical theories and pedagogical models, but you're going to contextualize it based on your understanding of, of the reality. So that whatever intervention that you're putting forth, they will they will be able to uh, adopt better. Right. So, okay, technology is definitely an enabler, but certain, certain things are still need the experience and even intuition and... Uh, uh, the knowledge that the teachers have and uh, then it uh, brings me to the next question that uh, we have access to remote learning we have technology enabling uh, personalized learning so uh, till now we have talked about learning design in context of a classroom for students so what what is the essence of learning design when we talk about lifelong learning or adult learning Lifelong learning has always been there. It's, uh, although it's uh, like a uh, buzzword now, people have always been learning. Okay? I mean, I, I give the example of doctors. I mean, they couldn't have survived without, uh, you know, learning, cont continuously learning. Uh, and anyone, even teachers, all, all good practitioners also keep in touch with their uh, with the knowledge in this. Okay? And, uh, and that's a sign of a good practitioner. Um, so when we talk of lifelong learning today, I suppose it's more to do with the kind of formal learning environments that you're creating for adult learners. Like, you know, the creation of MOOCs, uh, massive open online courses, or or even corporate learning, uh, and, and so on. So these are formal learning interventions that uh, you're creating for adult learners, right? Um, which is more structured. Otherwise, you know, lifelong learning could also involve informal learning. And there is no, not, not you know, there is nothing called a, very structured learning design for informal, informal learning. You can probably create an environment that that makes it better for uh, adults to look for informal learning opportunities, but you don't really design informal learning. Right. Uh, right. right. Um, uh, but yeah, you could you could be designing these courses. You could be designing uh, any kind of technology intervention which will help learn. Let's say uh, you know creating a simulation, creating a creating what they refer to as serious games uh, in, in for learning. If these are all things that a learning design plays, plays a part. Right, right. You need to understand, you know, you know, where, who are my learners? Which organizations do they work for? What kind of vertical is it? Uh, what kind of situations will work better for these learners? Uh, how likely are they to? Uh, how much time are they likely to spend on a particular day for learning? If they are, if they are registered for a, or a course like this, uh, and all of this information is required for creating that. Right. So, you know, you gave certain uh, suggestions for people who are designing these courses for uh, adult learners. So when we come to educators who are eager to enhance their uh, uh, learning, like you said, practitioners who are upgrading their self, that's a sign of a good practitioner. So if there is an educator who wants to uh, better understand learning design and uh, imbibe some of the good practices of learning design in their teaching, what would be your message suggestion for them? How can they uh, start? Because some of may not have been, you know, really exposed. Of course, they did some, you know, they did BED and all that. But uh, over a course of time, some practices may have been diluted. So how do they uh, realign themselves with the learning design, the good practices of the learning design? There are various ways. Um, let me talk about, about one of my favorite models. Is this thing called the backward design model. It's also called learning by design. So backward design is essentially you start from your goal. 
So you, you I, I, like if I'm teaching social science, what are the two or three key uh, ideas that I want a student to take away by the end of the day? Okay? Um, which is something that they'll continue to learn uh, in that in, in, in that area. Like let's say, for example, if I'm teaching history, for instance, what are the key things that I want you to take away from history? Like, for one, history is never about uh, uh, the why of history is interpretative, right? But it's not it's not anybody's interpretation. Mm -hmm. It is for you to interpret, right? Um, the what is something um, if it's been documented, but what stays? What could be considered a fact? Uh, sometimes even like anything beyond 340 years ago, even the facts are contested sometimes, right? Um, but so how do I look at history? What lessons can I learn from history today? Okay. Do I see patterns? But again, you need to be conscious. It's never, it's never the same like the past repeats. Past, you can learn from the past, but it, things that appear today will be quite different from the way in which past things right. happened there. There right. are certain lessons that we draw from. So broadly, there are certain, some of these broader ideas that I would, I would stress on. Okay. Um, so that's, so you start with those, uh, those big ideas in your, in your subjects. Or even in the topic that you're teaching, you identify what the big idea is, and I, I start from there in terms of how do I enable my students to go, you know, think about this big idea. So then I'll make my strategies. Even if I'm not, even if my current lesson is not really touching on that big idea in a direct way, I will ensure that I will include strategies to ensure that you know, children are thinking about those aspects too. Okay? So that's working backwards. So you start with your goal and then work backwards and see how I can fit in. How I can ensure that I'm moving towards achieving that goal. Right. You know, and, and learning outcomes, etc., are below the goal. Goals come first, then comes learning outcomes, and then then there are learning objectives. So learning outcomes are. Um, I mean, let me give you a very simplistic example. Um, take the example of driving a car. So learning to drive a car is the outcome. Okay. If learning to drive a car is the outcome, then understanding where the gear is, where the clutch is. Or uh, you know all those little aspects that I need to know for a drive a car, those become my learning objectives. Right? You know, understanding all of these aspects become my learning objectives, and then ultimately learning outcome is being able to drive a car. Okay? So learning objectives are at the you know in in, a, in the case of lesson planning, it's at the level of the text, mm. the, the text that I'm dealing with. But outcomes are you know once above that. Right, and goals are even you know goals higher. Even, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, so that's that's a very useful uh, message uh, for educator. And are there any resources uh, uh, that the educators can assess, uh, access and uh, uh, pick up at their own pace to learn about better designing their lessons? You know, uh, I, I, I've learned even from places like Twitter, um, because there are a lot of very passionate educators uh, and even cognitive psychologists who are very active on Twitter. Um, they will put forward their arguments there and they give references to, to their papers uh, there. Then you can go search for the papers and, and, and read up and see what they're saying. So there are, each one could use different ways. So I think why I said Twitter is do not write social media away. There are opportunities, although sometimes we, we may say that social media is loud and I don't want to be there. Yeah, I understand it. But, you know, in all these places, there are opportunities for them. Right. Um, and, and you don't know what you're going to find. So if you, if you are able to find good handles to follow, then you follow them and you learn a lot, lot from them. Uh, otherwise, as I said, um, there are, you know, you could, you could, you could register for, for a massive open online courses. Um, most of, for a lot of them are free courses. Uh, and at least you could audit a course for free, any which way. So you, there are sites like Coursera, edX, uh, and there are a lot of courses on learning design, pedagogy, and so on. Right. So in that way, technology is a, really an enabler for learning uh, the learning design because right. you know you have the courses at one end where you can go and learn personalized learning, and then you can also uh, 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 access other social media and uh, read about all these things. So there right. could be space to yes. repetition of your knowledge. You can even put in a comment and you are actually retrieving and applying your knowledge. You are getting feedback about what you have written and you may stand corrected uh, from there. So I think there is a whole uh, spectrum of resources available for educators 
uh, who would like to uh, update themselves on better learning design. So thanks, thanks for sharing that. And if you have any other specific courses or resources, uh, do share with us. We'll uh, you know put it in the show notes so that our educators uh, can access that. Yeah. Right, and uh, then getting on to uh, parents, you know, a uh, lot of parents today want to help their children learn better. They are very involved in the learning, and they want to continue the learning uh, at home also. So. I suppose that all these resources are also available to parents, but is there any specific, they may not necessarily have a teaching or background the experience and even the intuition for that. So uh, any specific message for them to help their children continue learning at home? Actually a very difficult question. Uh, I'm also a parent, so I know. <laughs> And as you rightly said, parents are not, not necessarily educated, except the parents, those parents who are, could also be teachers. Um, yeah, but having said that, um, you know, we, I suppose, again, it's not necessarily a, uh, you know, a fact, um, but if you yourself show an interest in learning, in whatever that you are learning, if you show an interest in learning at home, you're probably, your children could also show an interest in learning. Um, that's one. I think in terms of uh, conversations around school and learning. So you don't necessarily have to teach them things, but you know you can have conversations with them around what they learn in school today, asking questions, and then, uh, you know get, getting them engaged, uh, and uh, and you showing interest in what they're learning. Simple things like that. So so just asking any kind of questions is one. Second is encouraging them to ask questions. And not just encouraging, they will ask anything. You don't have to encourage them. Children are naturally good at asking questions. And, and be willing and be patient to listen to their questions. And if you don't know, to admit that you don't know and, and, and finding things out together, for example. They're all, you know, uh, probably good ways for you to engage with children in the process of it. So it's more about, you know, being engaged with their learning process rather than trying to be a teacher. Right. Right. Yeah, that's a uh, uh, important aspect, and that would also, like you know, for me as a parent, there are multiple ways of doing, uh, of helping the child do the homework. So one is that you are just addressing, answering the question which is there, yeah. uh, which will help uh, the child develop what you called as a textual knowledge. But another may be, you know, uh, creating more experiences around that topic so that Absolutely. you know, getting them to getting them to find out, find out. The answer maybe not just by looking up Google. That's the worst way of uh, finding information. But you know, if you can do an experiment together, for example, um, a small hands-on activity together, then these are all ways uh, you know you get children get engaged. Right. And and they're also the learning becomes a little more authentic. Right. You and especially if the task is something that's very realistic. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So that may also go into what you said, uh, lived memory, you know, when you have experienced those things, right? So, you know, uh, you shared all these concepts and, uh, you know, I'm already trying to invite them into, you know, my vocabulary so that we can practice, continue to practice with our children and students. And uh, uh, like you said, the, uh, just accessing Google, finding out the answer is not really, you know, the right way. It may be a starting point, but then it has to be followed by multiple uh, experiences, experimentation. So you just search Google and find answers. There's no learning there. Mm -hmm. You just got the information. Yes. And you're just going to copy that information, you know, put it into your worksheet or wherever. But, you know, for you to learn, you need to engage with, with concepts. And how do you engage with concepts? It could be a con even a conversation is a good way to engage with the concept. Uh, you know, doing an activity is, a, is another way to engage. But the thing is, when we talk about what we refer to as active learning, it all means the child or the learner is cognitively engaged in the process. He or she is thinking about what I'm learning, asking why questions, why is it important. That's a very, very important, uh, uh, you know, aspect that you have raised, sir, because in today's age, we just, uh, we come across a new concept, a new term, we Google and we think that, you know, we know about it. 
but until and unless we are really engaged we go to in depth we experience it it is not really learning so that's a very key point that you know uh, thanks for bringing that out because we all think we are experts in everything because we always have google we can refer to that so uh, yeah thanks for build, uh, bringing that out sir and then i would like to talk about the aspect that we had briefly touched uh, earlier uh, but you know i would request you to go slightly more in detail and that is the assessment so uh, how does learning design uh, what does it recommend in terms of uh, effective efficient uh, assessment of learning yeah um there are broadly two types of assessments, assessments uh, for learning and assessment of learning. Okay? Another way to, to refer to them is formative learn assessment and summative assessment. Uh, I'm more interested in formative assessment because summative assessment is something that systems need as evidence. So assessment of learning is something that a school system need or a state needs as evidence that you know students of a particular state or students of a particular district or a particular school have achieved uh, a certain level of learning. Um, you know, and that may be used for promotion or, or you know, uh, entry into an institution and so on. Uh, but what I'm, or what any of us as educators should actually be bothered about is assessments for learning, where, you know, you do an assessment to identify how much your students have understood about what you, what you talk about. Okay? And then you kind of personalize or customize your teaching to ensure that, because then you get an understanding of where, what is the comprehension level of my students today? And where is it that I need to fill the gap? So I can think about, uh, so it's like a feedback for me, the teacher. Right. This means all learning is a feedback for teachers that they can, you know, reteach with better clarity uh, once they have it. And assessments, all learning is not necessarily always a, um, you know, pen and paper test. It could be, it could be just like, as I said, question answer session in the classroom asking the students question you know uh, getting students to articulate their understanding not every of, in, in one sitting probably all 40 students may not be able to do that but over the course of a week for example you could you could do this so students may not even see this assessment but it's a practice whereby you're trying to gauge the level of student understanding right yeah? and when you ask questions about 10 15 students you get a broad idea of the overall level of understanding of the class and so that you can you, you know that whether what you the way you're teaching is working or not right yeah so that was uh, very interesting and uh, uh, so how we've discussed so much about uh, this concept of learning design and uh, thanks for sharing a lot of uh, examples of how it can be uh, implemented helping us understand how the theory part of learning design can actually be taken into the classroom and uh, be used to help the students learn better so i would like you to uh, answer how come you what was your journey into the field of learning design what was the motivation and how has the journey been so far great yeah i must say it was accidental to begin with um, I came. I came from a background in media and advertising. I was uh, on the creative side in advertising, and I was a journalist for a short while. Um, in, um, in in year, the year two thousand, I joined this company called Tata Interactive Systems, which was uh, uh, it was one of the biggest custom e-learning companies in India. Uh, by custom e-learning, it means that we would create learning solutions for uh, multinational companies or um, even universities abroad and even for education publishers like there are private publishers in, in the field of uh, in, in education in the us and the uk and other places so these were the clients of data interact systems and um, and i worked across you know multiple types of projects from k-12 to higher education to even corporate learning so that gave me a wide exposure to various ways in which you look at learning design and even various formats like Big simulations or, or you know, web-based learning solutions, self-paced learning, and so on. So around 2009, then a few of us from within Tata Interact were put on a, a project to work on creating a product for the Indian school uh, scenarios, uh, and that's how um, we started work on Tata Classics 
at the at the project even Tata in fact even 2011 was the year when Tata Classic as a brand was launched and today is a uh, independent company in in 2014 it became a separate division and today it's a, a separate company so, so and Tata Classic uh, you know gave me wide exposure to the cooling system in India so I traveled quite a bit uh, as part of my profile and uh, I was also working on something called social impact for a few years in, in Tata Classic that gave me exposure to the way in which teaching learning happens in underserved schools. So, um, so all of this built into 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 my learning. And while I did, while being a practitioner, I you know I also ensured that I'm I'm in touch with uh, what you refer to as the formal aspect of learning. So I would join courses, uh, read the books, uh, join discussions on Twitter, Twitter and other social media places. And engage with some of the experts over there, and 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 pick up a lot of my knowledge from uh, multiple sources. It's been an interesting journey, yeah. And also, thankfully, um, in 2014 there was a project with uh, MIT in Boston, uh, which was initiated by Tata Trust, and Tata Institute of Social Sciences was involved over there. And that was my first uh, uh, interaction with GISs, and and that continued too. So, and you know that's why. Uh, Last year, I, I joined uh, the Center of Excellence in Teacher Education uh, in Tata Institute of Social Sciences as a professor of practice. Right, right. So that has been an interesting journey, sir. And you mentioned that you also studied the social impact of uh, learning design. So, you yeah, know... I was, I was, that is my uh, profile. So my profile at Tata Classic was to, to head uh, both learning design and social impact. And social impact uh, for Classic actually meant um, the uh, great product was there and we also had created the Hindi version and some of the region, other in, in, and a few other regional languages too. So we would visit either government schools or schools that are supported by uh, foundations or CSR uh, cells uh, and uh, we would try and implement a solution there. And implementing a solution there also taught us a lot, taught a lesson because there are, you know, things are not the same uh, in other service schools versus private schools, which is what uh, classic just mean uh, Custom base was like the private schools, right? So, so there are a lot of lessons that I learned by interacting with with the teachers, headmasters of this um, gun. Not just government. When I say underserved schools, they're not just all government schools. So some of them were not government schools too, but they were like look what they refer to as budget private schools. Right. So you worked in different uh, sort of learning environments, but you know, learning. coming, yeah, and we have talked about the cognitive uh, aspects of uh, human learning, how we uh, retain information better. But what about the social emotional aspect of learning? What does learning de uh, design uh, say about these aspects of uh, a student's life? How, how do they interact, collaborate? And what is the impact of their previous, uh, you know, upbringing? So SEL is yeah, a key aspect. Learning science says very little about it. Okay. Um, even learning sciences is fairly uh, silent on those aspects, uh, which is one of the reasons why sociology of education is a critical, uh, you know, uh, a critical thing for teachers and for any anyone who's interested in education, because without having an understanding of sociology of education, uh, which gives you the picture uh, of social reality, you know, you can't be talking about some of these things in abstraction. Right. So you it, right? So you put this in, in the right context and see how it applies in certain context. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. And uh, sir, lastly, uh, you know, what would be your message for students? Students of all ages. Yeah. So, um, love for learning is something that, um, you know, it's a great um, love to have. Uh, because uh, if you if you really like learning, then you you're learning, and not just that. So it's about it's about you know. Uh, some time back, I've written a post on LinkedIn about uh, to ask what's in it for me when I learn something. It's a terrible question to ask uh, because that's like I I will only learn what's useful for me, right? That's not how you look at learning. Okay, you say what's in it. I mean, I won't know what's in it in, 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 in different places. So that's curiosity. Uh, and you don't, you never know how some of this knowledge might come up to use to you too. But the fact is not, don't look for learning from a very uh, self-centered perspective. Look for learning 
that's a very very beautiful thought sir i would encourage all students to actually you know go deeper into this aspect and uh, love to learn just for the you know just to know the whole concept but not just to derive a specific piece of information like we do when we are referring to google so that is not actually uh, learning that is just information retrieval so learning as you say is much bigger and you never know what piece of learning would be useful for you in the future so that's a beautiful thought sir thank you for sharing that sir so there are uh, we, uh, we have uh, covered a lot of ground today on learning design and uh, i really appreciate how you have uh, you know taken us from the theory concept some concepts also some terminology but also shared a lot of uh, uh, examples use cases practical suggestions on how this could be implemented in a real classroom and you also talked about the role of uh, teachers experience teachers uh, intuition in uh, uh implementing this uh, this science which is based on research but yes it has room for uh, experience and intuition also uh, primarily uh, because it starts with assessment of student which uses a lot of experience uh, the teacher may already has so i think uh, a lot of educators uh, would be comfortable that this is not something that you know is there in the textbook and has to be theoretically learned and then the entire uh their style has to be revamped i think it's more of a enhancement of their style if i have understood it correctly right right so uh thank you so much sir for coming on our channel sharing your uh, insights valuable insights on this topic sharing the various uh, resources the teachers can access giving examples they can implement in their own uh, classrooms and um i think uh, uh, i am encouraged to read more on learning design and uh, from a practitioner's perspective also so uh, that is really valuable and uh, uh, i would share your uh, email id with the educators and they can i hope they can get in touch with you for further questions or in case they want to seek any guidance yeah thank you thank you so much kavin i have really enjoyed the conversation Thank you so much. Yes sir, thank you so much for your insights and your time sir. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. I hope our discussion has been valuable for you with insights and takeaways which you can implement at your end. And do subscribe to our channel The Learning Circle. Join us as we dive into the enchanting world of learning. Engage in captivating discussions with educators, industry experts and thought leaders. where we unravel the secrets of the art and science of learning from groundbreaking teaching methods to cutting edge technologies our conversations will ignite your curiosity and empower you with knowledge prepare to be inspired and informed as we explore diverse topics that aim to transform lives and communities Join us now on our channel and become part of the conversation where we celebrate the incredible power of learning to shape a better future for all. Subscribe to The Learning Circle.